for any adult. If you have a kid, that catalyzes the transformation of your entire budget, right? It changes whether you're going to buy a car or not, start having a joint account, household, you write a will. So many changes happen with becoming a parent. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Ao, venture capitalist, Sarah founder, Harvard MBA, science fiction nerd, and dad of two daughters. Every week, we debate startup news, interview change makers, answer listener questions, and share personal insights. Join our movement of over 40,000 members and get transcripts, resources, and community at www.bravesea.com. Stay well and stay brave. HD Mall is a healthcare marketplace in Southeast Asia connecting patients to over 1,800 medical providers. This covers multiple categories such as dental, aesthetics, and elective surgeries. Over 300,000 patients have accessed more affordable healthcare via HD Mall. Get yourself a well-deserved health checkup. If you're in Thailand, go to hdmall.co.th. If you're in Indonesia, go to hdmall.id. Hey, Shien, How are you? Good morning. Good morning. I'm good. Yourself? Good as well. Just put the kids to sleep. Uh, I'm here in New York City, but definitely excited to have this discussion. There's so much news that we were just like sending to each other. And it was just like, oh, we've got to cut stuff from the stuff we want to talk about. I guess it's a busy start to January. And I think the big one that you and I were laughing about a little bit was that we saw this tweet where I said, Noah Smith at No Opinion, which is I think one of the world's largest sub stacks on geopolitics. And a lot of people really respect his writing. And he tweeted, I've only met two people in life who make me think, man, I would like to work for this person. Patrick Collins of Stripe and Jacqueline Poe of Singapore's Economic Development Board. And it's a big that's compliment. A, it's big. I mean, probably Stripe meets is... lots of interesting people. Exactly, exactly. Think about it, right? I mean, Stripe is like obviously a giant unicorn, global company. Patrick Collision is the CEO and co-founder. And then, yeah, Singapore's Economic Development Board is on par and Jacqueline Poe is there. So interesting tier to have. Well, is it a comment about Jacqueline or is it a comment about EDBI? Oh. Well, it could be both, right? I mean, you know, Jacqueline Poe is successful because of EDB and EDB is successful because of Jacqueline Poe. So maybe the I don't know. I read it. I read it as a sort of like a, this person was really amazing. Uh, I, I would like to work with them versus like yeah. this organization. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I think the organization is pretty interesting. And <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people actually, if you don't know anything about Singapore, you'd be like, what is an economic development board? Who are these people? But yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I thought it was a huge compliment. What do you think the context of that meeting is? I mean, I was just kind of wondering how they met. I don't know. Now we're just in the <laughs> realm of random speculation. This is rampant speculation. We'll be like, they met at a conference in Abu. A rampant they speculation. Met at Davos, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe in World Economic Forum. Maybe they met like other speculations. Like, we don't know. Maybe you should just ask her next time. Hey, you know what? Maybe you should ask her, invite her to explain what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we should have read yeah. But definitely I read a tweet. It's like, wow, that's amazing, you know. And a lot of folks read uh, Noah Smith. Well, you see, I think Noah Smith writes a lot about the US, the Western system, to some extent, civilization, society, technology. And Singapore does come up as one of those benchmarks or references that he uses as well. So interesting time to hit. We're the Continental Hotel, Jeremy. Do you ever watch what John con- Wick? <laughs> you, know, you know what? That's, that's you what revealed Singapore something. Is. I have never watched John Wick. It's on every secret. airplane flight. It's on every airplane flight. And like, there's four of them. You can't get away from it. Even if you try to not watch it, you keep flipping. You're like, oh, there's another John Wick. Oh, there's another John Wick. Should I watch this? I've given up. I mean, it's just like action. Obviously, I'm a big fan of, you know, the original Neo. But I can't get into this. Like, obviously, there's like the gun fu, kung fu combination. Yeah, yeah, and all yeah. That stuff, right? No, no, no. I mean, I'm not, I'm not really that into the fighting. But like, I feel like some founder told me this and I really like it is that Singapore is the Continental Hotel which is like there are rules you know like maybe outside there's chaos and fighting and murder but inside the Continental Hotel there are rules we lay down our arms and we like eat good food so that is, oh. that is Singapore in the in the geopolitical <laughs> totally flippant comment so you saying Noah Smith and Jacqueline Poe are like global assassins with yeah and then they met somewhere you know freestyle. in the Continental Hotel yeah <laughs> <laughs> Shredded ideas. There we go. So drinking the Singapore sling. There we go. Oh, so, the worst national drink ever. I hate this. You know, I was so disappointed because the Singapore sling is so famous, right? I drank it. I was like, what? what is going on here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we need a new national drink. Actually, I feel like that should be something. We should start a competition 
for a new national beverage. A new um, national beverage? Yeah, like, a new national cocktail to replace the Singapore sling because uh, it is disgusting. Well, this is where I can outperform our jet GPT. I can make some memes for it, even though I can't make it. So we can make the Malayan magic. How about that? You know, the Takwitiao chiller. The practical potion. stand up potion. for Singapore Supreme. That sounds like a pizza. No. Yeah, you think about creams so like pepperoni or something. Uh, speaking about other Singapore news as well, you know, there was a big interesting number that came out, which is that over the past year, GIC cut the capital deployed by 46% down to $20 billion. Uh, and Tamasic also cut new investments by 53% to $6.3 billion last year. While in comparison, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund emerged as the world's most active sovereign investor last year and grew from $20.7 billion in 2022 to $31.6 billion in 2023. So quite an interesting trend that happened. Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of reasons to pull back if people feel like valuations are high, they want to preserve capital for supporting existing portfolio companies. They want to reserve dry powder because they think prices will go lower. It's hard to speculate on various things. And then, of course, I think the Saudis and, and other Middle Eastern sovereign funds had a huge year just given oil prices and so have a lot of capital to deploy. Yeah, I think it's not really a Singapore thing, right? I mean, almost all funds kind of like pull back on deployment because of, like you said, the market uncertainty, the interest rates. So people are just waiting it out and trying to see what's happening. But the Gulf sovereign wealth funds, not just Saudi Arabia, but also Abu Dhabi, Qatar, all increase their deployment in their sovereign wealth funds as well. So it's quite interesting to see. I think you and I were discussing about recently the information was talking about how a lot of VC funds are now flying to the Middle East to raise funds again. I mean, after, the Khashoggi incident, I think people were very appalled and sort of sought to distance themselves from that. But I think as other sources of capital have dried up or slowed down, it's like, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. So you got to go to where money is. And so people have continued to raise from like, I mean, it's not just the Saudis, right? There's like a, more than a handful, two handfuls of, of sovereigns in the Middle East that are deploying and try to diversify. Like that's part of it. It's like they know their economies are very energy dependent and they need to be able to diversify out of that so they're being pretty aggressive there yeah it reminds me about how people forget that so many stories of like the tech rally for example there's uber dd you can grab a lot of the great companies that are out there a lot of them were funded by softbank which we know and i think people sometimes forget that softbank was primarily funded by middle eastern capital right mm -hmm. um, and so that was the unique marriage between a japanese investment team uh, at that point of time plus the middle eastern capital and i remember this usbc was telling me that from their perspective it was as if the death star appeared outside silicon valley so from their perspective because so the total size of the softbank vehicle that they had with the Middleton capital they had was effectively the sum total of all US VCs at that point of time. So it's as if like this Death Star appears above Eldoran and everyone's like, what the? Why is there so much capital? And how are they going to deploy it? And of course, I think Silicon Valley went off to be inspired by this and go off to raise large capitals pools as well which kind of kicks out the huge late stage growth equity trend uh, and momentum, which again pulled up the early stage. Again, it's also part of the zero interest rate policy era as well. It's kind of interesting to see that it all kind of like ties together for that. Yeah, RIP, low interest rate environments. R.I.P. R.I.P. Z.I.R.P. That's yeah, like, such a nerdy. R.I.P. Sorry. That'd be a funny t-shirt. It was just like one of those joke shirts. It's like, it's like nobody understands what it means. I said those were the good times, I guess. Yeah. Things can only stay free or cheap for so long, right? It has to be a corrective yeah. force. And Japan still has, happens to have lower interest rates on average compared to the rest. I mean, they're still looking to finally have more of that inflation they're looking for, stimulate the economy further. Yeah. You know, I think at the end of the day, what I've heard from someone else who's fundraising capital from the Middle East is that these investment authorities are very much focused, not just obviously on returns, because they have so much cash from the petroleum and so forth, and like you said, record high energy prices, but they also really focus on investments that they think will help them with the transition towards a new post-oil economy, which has been quite interesting. So they're out busy looking for renewables, manufacturing, robots, and basically saying, if we invest in you, we would like you to also invest a portion of that investment into something that works for our home economies, which is quite interesting, actually. Yeah, I think it's, it is it is a challenging thing, though, because when your economy has been so 
so driven by one industry for a long time. It isn't just like your workforce is trained in a specific way, right? People are used to doing things in a specific way. So it's hard to diversify out. And so when you tie strings to some of the stuff, then you end up with a bunch of artificial stuff because, you know, everyone's like, oh, if I want to get this money, I need to open a representative office in Oman or Riyadh or wherever. And then you end up with sort of a little bit non-economic things happening. But I think this transition was well underway. Even 10 years ago, I was in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And, and Dubai, you know, of the Emirates, Dubai had the least amount of oil. So that's why they've emerged as a financial center faster because they were like, oh man, we're going to run out of oil sooner than everybody else. We need to get on it. So it has been really interesting to see them be more aggressive on these sorts of diversification fronts. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of the Singapore story, right? And Lee you always like to say that we have no natural resources. So we had to go about building a financial sector, the education for our own people, and then also start moving up the manufacturing and assembly kind of production value chain. And I think recently we saw one of the fruits of that labor. We've been talking Talking about silicon and chips for a while. And so we welcomed our newest Singapore unicorn, Silicon Box. They raised $200 million in the Series B. So they hit over a billion dollar valuation, less than three years of its founding. Investors were Maverick Capital, Hedge Fund, Growth Investor, BRV Capital, Presidium Capital as well. And then they also had primary participation from Tata Electronics, Taiwanese Semiconductor Group, UMC, Japanese Electronics Group. UK and US semiconductor company Lamb Research. Yeah, and they're building a big facility, I think, Tampanese. Yeah, got to do those chips. It's exciting times. And I think this team is a team that has previously been founders in the industry and semiconductor space as well. So it's not exactly like a fresh out of university startup doing a giant round band of good old days, but it is a startup. Uh, I think they are building something new, but it's just interesting that, you know, I think people are doubling down on that set of investments for uh, Singapore. To diversify out of Taiwan, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, and I think it's not, it's an expensive facility, right? This one, like say in Japanese, is a $2 billion facility, 750,000 square feet. And you can imagine it's not just, the, it's just a build out, right? Let alone the running, the renovation the maintenance, and then all the continued investments in that facility to continue to upgrade it. It's a bonkers, I don't know, set of engineering requirements. Now, I would love to visit one day now that I think about it. It must be fun. I've been to a fab before. Ooh, what was it like? Describe it. I mean, you're in a clean room, right? Like they have to put on the, it's incredibly mechanized. If you're ever in the Bay Area, there's the Computer History Museum in San Jose, and they right. show the early semiconductor manufacturing machines. It's pretty cool. So I highly recommend that. But yeah. I mean, it's a marvel of engineering is, yeah. I guess, what I would say about that. Aha. Uh -huh. And when you say marvel is also like the founders who previously founded yes. the chip maker, marvel as well. There we go. I saw your pun there. There we go. Dad jokes. Not just Dad for dads. jokes. There we go. So kudos to the husband-wife duo, Sahat Sutajia, Wei Li Tai, and Han Leong Jun. So it will be interesting to see how that continues to play out. But I think we'll continue to see not just this investment, but I think more. It's an interesting career ladder for a lot of folks out there to do kind of like these microchips as a skill set. It's obviously. Speaking about entrepreneurship, we also saw recently Asian Parent as well did an acquisition. You share a little bit more, Shein? I think anyone who has kids has probably seen the Asian parent or used their groups or content. And they bought Motherwork, which is a, a retail chain, pretty prevalent. If you're ever in the market for a stroller or a car seat or cute clothes, you've probably seen them. And so they recently acquired that. And so I guess doubling down on the kind of an omni-channel approach. And so I hadn't known this, but Roshne, the Asian parent founder, actually was mentioning that they'd actually done a bunch of e-commerce in Indonesia. And they mm -hmm. actually have their own line of halal pre post pregnancy items so whether it's like creams moisturizer when you're pregnant and post pregnancy you're always trying to look for non toxic things and you're, you're like reading the labels and all that sort of stuff and it has sort of the added layer of being halal and compliant and those have really been popular in the online channel so it's interesting to go into the omnichannel approach right obviously it's like a pretty different skill set but mother work i think they're a long time singapore brand that team has experience operating stores can bring that to the combined entity and so it's an interesting move and i think you saw it with love bonito right it originally started out as a blog shop and then eventually wound up having physical stores and even for some of the earlier kind of u.s e-commerce ones whether it's warby parker bonobos they all wound up eventually having physical presence. And I think the twist here is like the Asian parent community that's wrapped around it for the motherhood journey. I got put into one of these P1 telegram groups. My daughter was like entering P1 and it was like, first of all, amazing. There's like all of these moms with the same singular focus 
get my child to RGPS, whatever it is. And the amount of energy, information, advice getting on that, that was like really mind blowing. So I think it's interesting. We're seeing more growth through acquisition consolidation in the space. I think we're going to continue to see that. And so congratulations to Roshni and the Asian parent team. But I'm kind of excited to see what happens from here. Yeah, I think shout out to Tershing for writing another great blog post on it. And I think he mentioned several interesting facts, right? Is that she has previously taken money from Vertex. They have to found it over 10 years ago back in 2011 and then Dershing helped involve her in the founder peer group where she uh, met her now husband is a leading 99.co as well. So another founder, husband as well, small world indeed. And I think it's interesting because he mentions a few facts saying that the Asian parent expanded to 12 million USD revenue in 2021, but was still loss making at 6.9 million. That was during pandemic time. And since then, they've been right sizing for profit. And their point of view and their statement is that they're currently EBITDA positive now in 2024. So I thought it was an interesting story, familiar one. I think a lot of people were very focused on growth during that pandemic period. And then now everyone's just kind of like figuring out how to right size and be cash flow positive. Yeah. It is funny though, right? Because like the market is parents and in Singapore, unlike some of our neighbors, we have a very declining birth rate. And it's like, this is a constant source of stress for like policymakers. So I was actually at the announcement of the acquisitions. Roshni had invited me and a couple other folks to be on a panel. And the topic was actually declining birth rates in Singapore, what we should do to fix it. And yeah, it's like, okay, what is the macro demand for my product? Babies. <sighs> Why are people not having more babies? How do I solve this? But fortunately, I mean, I think Asian parent, mother work, they're multi, multi-country regional businesses. And so I think we don't have that problem with our neighbors it's just here in Singapore that I think we're well below replacement rate. Yeah, I was part of that view? newspaper. Yeah, I was part of that newspaper article in 2020. And they were like record low birth rate in 2020. Who are these parents who are still having kids? And then I'm like featured with my wife and our kid. You know, frankly, I mean, I so don't bother. What would what yeah. would cause you to have a third kid? Because now you're at two, right? So replacement rate is 2.1, right? And then there's all these people not having children. So you, if you needed to raise the number, you actually need to do more. Okay, Jeremy, it's not enough. So what would cause you to have one more kid? Well, Straits Times always writing more articles about that. Uh, I think my point of view is that two things. It's at the end of the day, I think that parents want to have kids when they feel like they have enough space and financial resources. And so I think there's some interesting statistics out there, which is that when, you know, your car size limits and the requirement for car seats and so so forth has impacted the optimal family size down to like two kids or 2.5 kids in the US because it's hard to fit a family of four kids, for example, in a five-seat car, right? So there's some interesting econometric studies about those natural experiments to see how that affects fertility. But yeah, I think parents are, feel like they're financially secure and they have lots of space. I think they will have more kids naturally. And I think it was interesting because the only countries that we're really seeing is that the Norwegian and the French countries are starting to see a bit of a J curve where they have got kind of like topped out at the end and now it's no longer declining. It's kind of like going up a bit because they have enough social support. There's not much opportunity cost in terms of career to have kids as well. And people feel safe and secure. I think the only other country that's having lots of kids and the OECD actually is Israel as well. And I was talking to somebody and he was basically saying like, oh, if you have three kids, people think you're poor. I was like, wow, that's an interesting phrase. I never heard that before. Obviously, it's just one remark, but I think it just goes to that. You know, there's also a cultural aspect of it as well. Yeah. I mean, I do think that the, the zero to six phase pre-primary school is very expensive because of private childcare and things like that. And so if you have a two-parent family, then someone has to watch the kid. You have to pay someone to watch the kid. You can't necessarily yeah. assume that they have grandparents or, or other family members who are available to, to help out. And so that does seem like an area where perhaps public policy can play a role in helping to alleviate some of those costs. But I put out the thought that I think it's also a mindset thing, which is like yeah. everyone feels competitive. Like, oh, it's very competitive right. for my kid to get a job and make it, you know, cost of living, all this sort of stuff kind of compounds onto that feeling. And so they're like, I need to husband my resources and pour them into this one child yeah. versus, oh, I'm gonna have three kids and they'll be fine. I don't need to hot house them to be, what is it, baby Mozart or whatever the case may yeah. be. And I think that's a much harder thing to change. I have a lot of thoughts about that because I actually studied economic demography back in undergrad and so very interested in this topic. And you know that I also worked on an early childcare education company as well. And those trends that you mentioned is totally true because from an objectively and historical perspective, this is the easiest time to have kids, right? And what I mean by that is you go back a thousand years ago, there's bad sanitation and there was random wars, civil wars, then in hunger. And if you go back to like 200 years ago to 100 years ago, life was really, really hard and people had lots of kids, right? Was, was reading this. Well, they had no birth control, uh, Jeremy. As well, that's true. But I'm just saying like, 
today is objectively easier in many ways because I was reading what to expect when you're expecting. There's like hospital packing bags, like you got to arrange all this stuff beforehand, so so forth. And I was like, oh, today in Singapore, there's like one day shipping, one week shipping. You don't have to pack like months in advance for everything. We didn't have diapers and stuff like that. And we just went to the supermarket and we bought diapers, right? I mean, I'm just saying like the convenience of the modern lifestyle is an order of magnitude simpler than why it was our parents, let alone our grandparents and great grandparents. So from perspective is, I think today it's as good a time for many societies, for many parents in those societies versus in a historical time frame. But I think like you said, the mindset has changed where it's also the hot housing aspect about it is very important. And the truth is that concentration of resources has also generated a lot of these businesses. I mean, I was like looking at the different kind of car seats, right? If you have a couple hundred dollars out of it, thousands of dollars. And you know, like, you can imagine education as well. There's a certain dynamic where concentrating more resources on fewer children also means that you have more resources to spend, which fuels, to some extent, the daycare categories and so forth. So one of the big categories growing in Southeast Asia is what historically would have been called premium daycares. Because now, let's not go to that mainstream or mass daycare. Let's go to a premium one that has all these A, B, C better teachers, which I think are important and obviously have some level of outcome as well. It's just that you wouldn't have that trend if parents didn't have that mindset shift as well. So it's an interesting yeah. consumerization as well and disposable income for parents to become parents. Yeah. I guess the one question I had was like, why does school stop at 1.30? And someone said, oh, it's because it used to be a morning session and afternoon session when we didn't have enough schools. Right. We had to split the school session, but that's not true anymore. And so it presumes that you have someone who's available to pick your kid up in the middle of the day, but we also want like, you know, high female workforce participation rate, not to assume that the mom is the one who's always picking up the kid. But then it's like, then you have to occupy your kid and that's more cost and more logistics. And it's like, why don't yeah. actually school can run until five? Yeah. But exactly. it doesn't have to be academic. Actually, we're a wealthy nation. We can play sports. We can learn how to play an instrument. Yeah. We can just run around and have fun. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. I was like, why? Why is that? I'm so curious. I mean, like you said, it's more of a historical norm, right? And it's just the understanding that parents would fill up the rest of the day with other activities and so, so forth. But like you said, it's a little bit outmoded because the truth is, why not? And I think you see that, actually, I always look at it in terms of a historical arc of education is like universities used to be optional, right? And then eventually K1 to K12 was also optional for people who could afford it. And it was all kinds of various kind of structures, very loose. And then eventually the governments went on to nationalize the education system by formalizing or encouraging people, eventually mandating people to do some kind of graduate education, eventually mandating K12, you know, 1 to 12, primary 1 to primary 6 to secondary school, to high school junior college. So actually what we see in the world today is we also see that a lot of countries are deciding to fold preschool education into the national ministries of education. Exactly because of what you said is that on a private basis, people kind of want this, but from a government perspective, you want this higher birth rates, then you want people to have a better way, work experience, then you kind of want to subsidize, but also you want to expand the hours so that, you know, normal life and zoos, right? Yeah. I mean, one thing I really appreciated during the pandemic was that they didn't shut the schools down. Oh yeah, big one. Because I think, you know, for my friends in the US, like that was a major issue during the pandemic was like schools were closed, which made working extremely challenging, right? Even like the circuit breaker period was brief. It was only two months, but it was really hard to work with little kids running around your house. So it was an interesting, it was like a fun panel to be part of, but it did make me ask a lot of questions about what is the right setup or format of public education and why should should it be left to parents to like, and to feed the sort of hot house industry, which we could debate whether that actually serves a positive social good or not. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the inverse of that is crazy if you think about it, right? If you have your birth rate is effectively one for every two parents, that means your population house for every generation effectively. So every 70 years on average, your population goes down in half. It's actually kind of a crazy thing. And you see that in Japan and to some extent Korea really, it's like the aging population has a serious impact on the economy and China's like off busy building robots now. It does the recent article because they continue to shrink in terms of population. So it's not just an individual problem, but it's actually kind of like a structural policy problem. And also it creates these incentives and economic pools for companies like Mother's Work and Asian Parent, right? I mean, I think we definitely see a huge category of parenting apps, I would say, in Southeast Asia. So uh, what's been interesting is that you see Indonesia and Vietnam, there's a lot of new parenting apps are uh, looking to build that authority from a pediatrician, doctor, medical, also from a nutrition, supplement, enrichment perspective and try to bring it together in a full stack so there are multiple competitors in the space now. And from their perspective, it's kind of like going through what Singapore did several decades ago, which is that narrowing to have less children, but more focus on economic resources on those fewer children and a rising middle class. And that generates that pool of capital 
um, looking to yeah. buy, right? And productivity, right? Yeah, that's true. So I think a lot of people are interested in investing in this category. You can call it education. But I think I always tell some VCs while looking at education as a category, it's like, it's not really education per se, because education is often very much a policy and government thing. But then if you think about it, for any adult, if you have a kid that catalyzes the transformation of your entire budget, it changes whether you're going to buy a car or not, what Event. to buy, exactly. Yeah. Start having a joy in a car, food, you write diapers, your will. how you write a will. It's like so many changes happen with becoming a parent and education is a subset of the category that's focused on the child. So I think it's an interesting dichotomy that I think founders who are looking to catalyze, activate that, I don't know, as a personal finance transformation or consumer persona has to be talked about. Yeah, definitely. So you didn't answer the question though, Jeremy. What would Which what question? would incent Which... you to have a third kid? Yeah, I hear I wouldn't mind having a third kid. But it definitely has some challenges, I would say. I mean, we have two wonderful daughters so far. So yeah. I don't know. I'm gonna say no. Is Candace listening? Yeah, she does. So yeah, so I think that's really the crux of it, right? But you know, like you said, it boils down to career, it boils down to security, with some sort of stability. What is very true, and I think it's interesting because I've seen this, which is obviously ink freezing became legal in Singapore recently, only for married straight couples. So that's one side of it. But also I recently saw some startup decks for artificial wombs, right? The promise of extending the reproductive window. And one thing that was interesting is that actually there are a lot of people who love to have more kids when they're older. It's just that they can't have kids. So I have friends who are going through IVF right now because they are trying to have kids and they started late because there's not reproductive health issue. So for example, there's a founder, Anna Hatanto, right? She's recently built a platform for parents to look for uh, IVF or egg freezing services. And she's partnering that two-sided marketplace of clinics and service providers, along with the other parents from across Southeast Asia. So very interesting set of opportunities to explore. Yeah. I mean, I think the legalization of egg freezing was a good first small step. I think limiting to married straight couples is pretty narrow. And so I think they should consider expanding that to single women. I think this issue is sort of like, do you want to do it yourself? You want to wait for a partner. But then for women, like there's a biological clock, right? And so you get to a point where it's like, well, I don't have a partner, but I still want to have kids. So what are my options here? And actually in the US, I have a number of friends who are single moms by choice. They're professional women. They never met the right person, but they're like, I still want to have kids and I'm going to go do yeah. that while I can. And yeah. they have the resources to their parents come help, all that sort of stuff. And now they've got kids and they've got their family. And now there's less pressure to go find someone that might not be a great fit just because you want to have kids and more mm -hmm. like, hey, we can take our time and then work it out. So I, I think that's something that we should consider locally as well if we really want to increase our birth rate. That there are all these pockets of people who want to have kids yeah. are limited by some legal reason rather than some actual biological. I 100% agree. I was reading this book by Laurie Gottlieb. She's a therapist and she was sharing about her own experience and decision to eventually become a single mother. And she went to a sperm bank and eventually got her own kid. And I thought it was a really fascinating story because it's the first time, obviously, reading about this experience as a real life story, uh, you know, female character point of view. And from my perspective, it's like, yeah, why not? She's totally equipped to be a parent. She's a therapist. She's at the prime of her career. She's thoughtful. Why not? Right. And I think there's a, hopefully an update of, I don't know, societal understanding and policy decisions to make it happen. Yeah. I think the other thing is also we had some friends who had trouble conceiving and they looked at adoption and adoption is actually really hard Yeah, as a route to build a family through adoption. Like multiple years, you know, it's sort of like you were making the decision like, hey, should I do IVF or should I try to pursue adoption because, you know, it has some fertility issues or whatever it is. I think the lack of certainty on the adoption side plus the timeline actually makes a lot of people go like all right i'm going to do ivf while i still have a window and yeah. then maybe after that then you end up considering adoption you know, i was reading some interesting articles by economic demography and one interesting aspects they had was that historically rich families before the birth control pill would have lots of kids and so the way that income inequality would drop or it was because richer families have more kids they split up across more kids their grandkids have less of inheritance and then that kind of generates that equalization. And I thought it was an interesting read and a thought-provoking thought. Maybe that was, I, I don't know whether there was less concentration of wealth. I mean, like, let's say you're Jeff Bezos. You could have a thousand children, it wouldn't matter. But if he only has one, then the kid would definitely be very, very rich, right? Whereas if a thousand, then everyone's just like, has a hundred billion dollars only. I mean, it's, it's a big difference, obviously. It totally regenerates. And the story of what they say, the first generation makes the money, the second generation keeps the money, the third generation loses the money, right? So, you know, 
there's a dynamic of generational wealth. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. But yeah, I think on the sort of education topic, I've been seeing lots of interesting stuff like AI tutors for math and English and reading, yeah. language. My business partner, Elizabeth's like, why bother learning another language? AI is just <sighs> going to let all of us speak our native language and let the other person hear it natively anyway. But I don't know. I still think that language and culture and history are so deeply intertwined that yeah. there's still benefit to learning another language because it kind of gives you insight into that history and culture even if google translate can like tell you what i'm saying it like doesn't <laughs> communicate the depth of all of that nuance but maybe one day we'll get there well on that note we did launch the brave indonesia podcast which is basically us you know speaking and we're 100 percent dubbed into bahasa indonesia and it's kind of interesting oh my God. So, i yeah. want to get feedback on it okay like you know, how I good don't... is the dubbing or do we sound like totally crazy we sound like ourselves in terms of tone and so so forth and by the exact accuracy of the words, you know, it's something that I'm kind of like shrug and <laughs> just give it a shot, right? You know, so on that note. Oh, wait, be- can I do one plug? We just released a free book called Raise Millions. And so it's basically a collection of everything that we've learned about early stage fundraising in a free book. And so I guess we'll put the link in the show notes, but check it out and go out and raise that money. Great. Awesome. And then no others to summarize the three big takeaways I got from this conversation. First of all, I think it was fun to discuss a little bit about Singapore in terms of the Economic Development Board, the GIC, Temasek, and talk a little bit about their various moves and permutations across 2023 into 2024. And also it was fun to chat a little bit about Noah Smith's uh, opinion on Jacqueline Poe at EDB. Um, We'd love to have you was, on the pod. Second one is that uh, we got to talk a little bit about various companies like Silicon Box, which is Singapore's newest unicorn, and talk a little bit about continued trend of semiconductor manufacturing migrating uh, into Southeast Asia. Thirdly, it was good to hear about Asian parent business and acquisition of mother's work. And so it was interesting to talk about some of the numbers, but also the rationale about omnichannel and the economics of the deal. And we got to talk a lot about education and our thoughts about parenting and some of the national policy and dynamics and why education and parenting are such hot verticals for startups across Southeast Asia, which ranges all the way from doctors for children care, all the way to premium daycares, all the way to IVF and egg freezing. On that note, thank you so much, Shien. Thank you, Jeremy. Get some sleep. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave.